I wanted to introduce Dr. Jonathan Hirsch. You can see up in the corner there. He is an orthopedic surgeon and a sports medicine specialist. He is on staff at West Boca Medical Center, um, and he's also part of TFPS, Tenant Florida Physician Services. Um, and today he's going to be discussing hip arthroscopy. So I will turn it over to Dr. Hirsch. Great, thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us for lunch today. Uh, sit back, relax. I'm gonna try to teach you the basics about hip arthroscopy, uh, what I do uh, for it, how we treat it, and hopefully uh, we can help some of you if you have uh, similar issues. Um, today, we wanna to try to understand the anatomy of the hip, uh, the science behind the hip, hip mechanics, the basics of uh, treatment of hip arthroscopy and what your expectations could be uh, if you eventually uh, needed surgery. A little bit about me, my training. Uh, I went to undergrad at Duke University. I uh, got my medical degree at uh, NYU in Manhattan. Did my residency uh, at Long Island Jewish North Shore and did, did an extra year of fellowship arthroscopic training uh, at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. And I've been in practice now over uh, 20 years. So if you read anything about hip arthroscopy, which has really uh, just taken off in the last 10 years, the amount of understanding of what we know about the hip more and how we treat it through a camera, uh, you'll see a uh, reference to something called FAI or femoral acetabular impingement and then subsequent labral tears. What's interesting about FAI is that we know from the research that patients often see many doctors before the correct diagnosis is, is made. And on average, it can take two years just to make a diagnosis, uh, in part because FAI uh, wasn't taught to a lot of uh, us in medical school or residency. It's something more the last 10 or 15 years has come to light. Um, and it's also, as I'll talk about, the symptoms of FAI and label tears is not quite the same and can be very variable. The source of the pain is what sometimes is the challenge. Uh, as we all know that when you have symptoms, it's not always textbook. It would be awesome if every patient came to my office doing what this is doing on the right, just pointing exactly to the hip joint and say, yep, my, came, my pain comes from right there. Unfortunately, hip problems can be felt in the back and the groin, can be felt laterally uh, on an area called the greater trochanter. It could be felt in your buttock. Uh, it can be felt multiple places, and it may not even be there on physical exam, although you feel it every time you take a step or run, which I think contributes sometimes to the, the confusion and the length of time it takes us to make a diagnosis of FAI. Anatomy, the hip, just like the shoulder, is a ball and a socket. But unlike the shoulder, the hip is a very stable joint inherently. You can see here on the diagram that the ball really fits deeply in the socket uh, called the acetabulum. So for most patients, it should be a very stable joint. FAI is when the ball and socket are not quite normally shaped. It's supposed to really be round on round, uh, but an abnormal shape can be almost like a square peg in a round hole. When the, the ball or the socket has too much bone or too little bone, the mechanics are thrown off, leading to loss of cartilage, otherwise known as arthritis, or a tear of the labrum. This impingement, this uh, imperfection of motion and contact causes tearing of the labrum and the cartilage, and the pain comes from these tears. It's kind of like your tires being out of alignment. If you ever looked at a tire not in alignment. On the right side, you see the treads are perfect. On the left side of the tire, there is no more tread. The same thing happens uh, in the hip over time. The wear and tear of living your life with FAI can cause labral tears and arthritis. We try to classify patients into what we call cam and or pincer impingement. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the arrows are pointing to an area of the ball where there's too much bone. On the right-hand side, the arrows are pointing to the socket where there's too much bone, and that's called pincer. A lot of patients have both. In the pincer type, you can see the red area, there's too much bone on the socket side. Most of the time, it's something you're born with, but it can be acquired over time from sports and injuries. And here's a diagram of a femur, of a ball and a socket. As it flexes, the green triangle is the labrum. And you can see if there's too much bone on the socket, the neck of the ball kind of crushes that green. Now the red 
is the cartilage. So you can see in someone who has pincer impingement, the labrum really can get damaged severely. It almost gets crushed, as you can see. And what you see in this diagram, the hip is almost coming out of the socket. If you see here, the ball is in the socket here, the ball is coming out. So it is a subtle form of what we call instability, where the ball starts to lever out of the socket. And if you see on the bottom, there's some damage to the red cartilage on the back of the hip. So you can get damage on the front and the back. And as the comes back to neutral. And here's the cam type. The red area is on the femur. There's too much bone, whether you're born with it or it's acquired, we're still trying to figure that out. But here the yellow represents a bump on the bone. And you can see what happens to the labrum and cartilage and cam impingement. The labrum actually lifts up, but doesn't really get, does, doesn't get crushed, it gets elevated. But you can see the cartilage, the red area really gets kind of crushed. So when you do an arthroscopy of someone with cam impingement, you can predict that the labrum may be detached and in decent shape, but the cartilage starts to really get damaged. And that's the earliest stage of arthritis. So when we do hip arthroscopy, we call it hip preservation surgery because our goal is to preserve the hip joint preventing arthritis. Now, some people have what's called hip dysplasia. It's a combination of problems where there's actually not enough bone on the socket or the femur is not pointing in the right direction. And it can be combined with a hip that's essentially loose. If there's not enough ball, the shallow cup can't contain the ball. If there's not enough socket, excuse me, the shallow cup can't contain it and the ball kind of moves around in the socket too much, leading to abnormal forces or instability. Again, tearing the labrum, causing premature arthritis. But sometimes, like in a hip like this, we have to do something to the bone. If you look, this is a severe case of dysplasia where you can see that the sockets are really, really not lining up right. So you can see, if you can see my arrow, the socket sort of goes on an angle up and is really a lot of the, the, stock, the ball is just sticking out of the socket. And that's dysplasia. But what it can be treated is with an osteotomy. So I have a partner who does this where he has to cut the bone and you can see now there's more coverage of each. And then we also combine this with hip arthroscopy. Um, some patients, like this is my daughter, who's a dancer, have just very lax tissues. Putting yourself into this position is not really what the human body was made for. But these extreme of positions in some sports like dancing and hockey, like a goalie, can cause instability, laxity, and labrum tears. And here's a research study that showed a very flexible individual. This is someone who doesn't really have hip pain, but you can see when she goes into a split and you take an x-ray, the hip actually comes in the, out of the socket. In the bottom right, you can see what's called the vacuum sign. This hip opens up from nine millimeters in a standing position to 13 millimeters. So her hip is actually partially subluxing or dislocating. And you can imagine how hard it is to treat this patient if she develops symptoms in a labral tear. What is the labrum? It's a soft tissue extension of the cartilage of the cup, it's like a suction seal. It can tear, usually in the front of the hip, but sometimes in the back, but it basically deepens the socket. It functions as a seal, it provides stability, and it pro protects the cartilage. We know from histological studies that the cartilage and the labrum are connected. They are, they are basically supposed to be one structure in continuity, but when they separate, that's the beginning of arthritis. The, the workhorse of diagnosis is an MRI. The little arrow points to that little black triangle, which is separated from the bone. The large triangle actually points to the cartilage is starting to also separate from the labrum and the bone. Early arthritis happens. What type of MRI? I prefer to get the highest quality MRI I can, which is called a three Tesla. Uh, unfortunately, not all our MRIs are created equal. I unfortunately have to reorder MRIs on patients that come to my office where the quality wasn't good. It's a very small structure, and you really need a high-quality MRI to find a labral tear. However, it could be read torn uh, incorrectly or not torn incorrectly. In other words, it's a little subjective. It's a small structure, and it's sometimes hard to prove that there's a torn labrum. Really, the history and the exam and the MRI, if you put it all together, makes the diagnosis. We know from tons of research that many patients 
have what appears to be a labrum tear on MRI, but actually don't have any symptoms. So it could be a normal part of some people's life. But we always order x-rays and people always ask, well, doc, I have an MRI, what do you need x-rays for? Well, part of the problem, as I said, is a mismatch of bone um, shape and x-rays are way better than MRI to measure the shape of the bone. Here's a patient on the left with a normal angle of the socket. On the right is a very dysplastic individual. That 30 degree angle of the socket is way high. And you can see that half the hip is sticking out of the socket. So as I go through these x-rays, just showing you examples of some angles that we measure, x-rays are just as important in treating this disease as MRI. And we also get CAT scans if we're gonna go to surgery for three-dimensional imaging. Now, labrum tears, most of these occur from minor injuries or really no injury at all. Most, but not all, are related to femoral tabular impingement. Most people have some kind of mismatch in the shape of the femur in the socket, or they don't have enough socket that dysplasia I talked about. The classic symptoms of a labral tear is groin pain when, when sitting, twisting, or pivoting. You can feel it, as I said, lateral in the butt or the thigh, and clicking and catching is some of the worst symptoms that people have. But as we all know, lots of things in orthopedics can mimic other things, and I call it the diagnostic buffet. Here are some of the causes of hip pain from the joint or intraarticular. Many different things can mimic the pain of labral tears. And then there's all these extra articular things outside the joint that can hurt in the, in the groin or the hip. Um, things like bursitis, muscular pulls, um, sciatic nerve problems, et cetera. So this is, again, why it takes sometimes a lot of time and effort to make a diagnosis. When we make the diagnosis, as I said before, CAM FAI, which you can see in the bottom right, that white arrows basically point to a large bump over the femoral neck. On the top is what it does to the cartilage. You see all that, that area of basically shredded cartilage, that, that metal device is a shaver that we use. This is a hip arthroscopic photo. And here's me just cleaning it up to try to get a sense of how bad the damage is. And this can be reattached, but some of the cartilage just wears off um, and, and we have to do other things. Here's again, a hip arthroscopy photo. You can see the ball, here's the socket, here's the labrum, which looks really decent, but looks what happens when it separates from the cartilage. It's just shredded. So this is, again, another picture of CAM FAI, where the cartilage labrum separation is happening. How do we do hip arthroscopy? We have to put a patient in traction. Um, we use x-ray as we do the case. Uh, I use now a system called the Guardian, where we're actually pulling against no post. You can see here the traditional hip arthroscopy, there's a post between the patient's leg that we found that if you can just take the table and place it in reverse and just put the patient a little bit of an angle, you can pull against gravity. Without that post in between the legs, we've lessened the chance of having some numbness and tingling uh, in the thighs, pulling on the groin. Uh, so this, the invention of this table has been excellent uh, for my practice. What do we do with the cam? Again, why x-rays are so important, on the left, you can see the bump, and on the yellow, on the white right, you can see a nice smooth border that we're able to arthroscopically reshape with a burr. And here's a case where I'm taking away some of the uh, cartilage, and you can see the bone nicely freshened up uh, with a burr. Now, pincer, you can see the angle on the left has too much bone lateral to that red line, and on the right is after surgery, we basically, with a burr, trim the end of the socket making it a more normal shape. And again, here's using a burr on the bone. For reference, the labrum is over here. The burr is on the socket, slowly removing uh, the extra bone on this patient. And then finally, we repair the labrum. This is all done through a camera. You can see the blue sutures wrapped around the labrum with knots tied. Sometimes I'll tie knots. Sometimes we use knotless devices. Basically, our goal is to put the labrum back where it belongs so it heals properly. But some labrum tears are very subtle. Here's a patient who has pain with a normal MRI. When we went to surgery, we were convinced, but you could see the instability. As I push on the labrum, you can see the cartilage uh, basically separating. And here's a more extreme example. This is called the wave sign. That probe, you can see the bubble that appears in the cartilage, the labrum above it, that white stick structure. I'm pushing on the cartilage. And this is why it leads to arthritis. And here's a really extreme example. 
of a basically a hip that has an unstable labrum, but the labrum is fine. And you can see how it tears all the way down into the cartilage, forming this wave sign. It's very unstable. It shouldn't wobble up and down like that. And the, and the cartilage should not move with it. What do we do? We put stitches through the cartilage and the labrum and get to this photo once again. Sometimes the patient comes in and the labrum is just absolutely destroyed, or they've had one or two attempts at arthroscopy and it didn't work. So here's a patient who had a reconstruction of the labrum. That piece of tissue with the sutures wrapped around it is actually a, a cadaver tendon. So we can make you a new labrum, reform your suction seal if necessary, if you don't have enough tissue to fix. Again, the cartilage, you can see the shredding of the cartilage on this patient. We clean it up to get, assess the damage. And sometimes we have to do what's called a microfracture. The, the, the bare space here at the tip of this sharp object right here is what arthritis looks like in a small version. This is just about 10 millimeters. And what we do is we puncture holes in it to get bleeding. The, the um, stem cells from the bone marrow enters the defect and forms like a scar cartilage. It does require a little more time on crutches, up to six weeks, and use a continuous passive motion to, a machine to form, help the clot, the blood clot, form into cartilage. So after surgery, what would you expect? Well, we like our patients to sleep on their back for about a month to protect the repair. We usually use these little foam boots to keep your feet straight up while you're in bed so your feet don't rotate out, putting stress on our repair. The brace, as you see in the bottom right corner, is a typical brace I'll use for about three to four weeks. It allows you to walk, it allows you to sit, but it's preventing some extremes of motion to not pull apart the repair. Crutches in general is two to three weeks putting weight on it, but using crutch protection, again, longer with microfracture or a reconstruction. We use a device called a CPM, continuous passive motion, to move the hip very slowly while you're sitting on the couch or in bed to prevent scar tissue, if we can get it for two weeks, up to six weeks if microfracture, if approved by insurances. Driving, obviously, if you, in America, we use our right leg to drive, about six weeks to drive if we operate in your right leg, maybe two to three weeks if we operate on your left, as long as you're off any kind of narcotic pain medication. Returning to work obviously depends on your job. If it's a sitting job, about two to four weeks, although people could be a little uncomfortable sitting for more than 30 minutes after a hip arthroscopy for at least four to six weeks. Heavy manual labor, to be honest, could be up to four to six months because it really takes three to four months for a labrum to heal before we want to overstress it. Returning to school for kids that we operate on, usually within a week to 10 days, most kids are comfortable enough to get to school. Rehab, the very complex joint. Rehab can take many, many months. Um, we have certain things we want to avoid, like lifting the leg up, the hip flexors, can get some tendonitis, um, to be very excruciatingly painful. We're always warning our patients and the therapists to not do too many straight leg raises after surgery. Return to sports can be up to six months for running sports. Expected timeline. So about a week, most patients are independent. You've already started some physical therapy and most are off any kind of pain medicine within a week. Within six to eight weeks, you're resuming normal function, but a little sore at the end of the day. Three to four months, our therapy gets more intense and more fun, to be honest. More functional training, sports-like activities, starting to feel normal. And over six months, return to sports and activities that you love. Um, but it really depends on the severity of the disease beforehand, the type of sport. And the literature really shows that people will continue to improve up to two years. So we don't give up on patients at nine months that are still having some difficulty. Um, that's about all I have to say today. I want to give you guys time uh, for questions. Um, so a little overview, a little peek into what we do in hip arthroscopy. Um, so if you want to if you have any questions for me, uh, feel free to type them uh, and we can get to those. How does the pain and recovery compare to other procedures? Well, it's interesting. You know, the more hip arthroscopy I do, I'm always impressed that it's something about the arthroscopy that I have my patients come in the day after surgery. They're actually feeling already within one day better than they felt in years. Because as I said, a lot of these people come when they find me, they've already been dealing with this for three, four years. We basically only make three holes, maybe four in the hip. So as far as damage, it's very minimal. I, I would say it's on average the same pain as a, a simple knee arthroscopy. I have found it's much less painful uh, than a shoulder arthroscopy. 
Um, and then there's a question, I think it's related to COVID in terms of safety and going to get this done right now, or is this the type of thing that should be delayed? I definitely don't want to delay it. As, as I showed you some of the really bad cartilage labrums that can hurt, hurt, happen if you let it be. You know, at the hospital, everyone gets tested for COVID before. So no, sur no elective surgery is being done on a COVID positive patient, only emergent. And they are in separate operating rooms and completely separate parts of the hospital. Uh, so I, I think at this point, you know, I do not think delayed care is, is wise. Uh, in, my, in my office and most offices I know of, we take uh, COVID very seriously. We clean every room. Everyone's wearing a mask. We check temperatures, distance in the waiting room. We try to keep patients moving so people are not in the waiting room at the same time. So um, these could be really, you know, even just six months you let go by, you can go from a, a minimal damaged labrum to a shredded labrum. So uh, I think you really should get it checked out if something's bothering you, not delay. Unfortunately, COVID is going to be with us for a while, but we have a really good handle on now how to, how to separate patients, especially at the hospital. Wonderful. Um, and then we had another question. How do you determine if a patient needs this as opposed to a total replacement? So that's where the arthritis comes into play. Um, certainly the x-ray is the standard for arthritis. So we're looking at the joint space, joint space narrowing. If that space becomes narrow, less than three millimeters, uh, you have an MRI that shows arthritis. So someone's dominant part of their problem is arthritis, and they also happen to have a, a labral tear, and they're over the age of, say, 50, they're more of a hip replacement candidate. There are patients either too young for hip replacement or sort of in between a little bit of arthritis and a labral tear, and that's where the science of medicine comes in, and we have to really have a long discussion because if you do a hip arthroscopy with someone with significant arthritis, it will fail. Um, so we try, we always try to avoid that. Uh, we're trying to get to the patient with minimal to no arthritis. So it really is dependent on the extent of arthritis uh, and their age. Perfect. Those were the only three questions I had um, come through. Um, okay. So thank you for your time giving this talk and thank you everyone for joining. And again, this was Dr. Jonathan Hirsch. He is an orthopedic surgeon. He is part of Tenet Florida Physician Services and he's on staff at West Boca. Um, feel free to contact his office if you'd like to schedule an appointment or if you have any other information, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, bye.